Hello, Reza. Hey, Eli, what's going on? Uh, nothing much. It's a, it's a rainy, hot day in Washington. How are you doing? A beautiful, sunny day in Santa Monica. Okay, so we, we, we talked about this. We're going to talk about two things in this dialogue. The first being the uh, aborted uh, multiple bombing plot in the United Kingdom, in London and Glasgow. And uh, what does this mean for social cohesion and social peace uh, in the West between uh, Islamic communities and uh, the uh, non-Islam, not, and, and Western or non, non-Muslim communities? Well, you know, I just got back from uh, a week in London. I was hanging around uh, with various members of the community, talked to some counterintelligence people, spoke to Peter Clark, um, I talked to some Muslim groups there who are banding together and forming these organizations, like, for instance, the Change Institute, uh, which is working to counteract uh, the rise of, of radicalism and extremism amongst uh, the UK's Muslim youth. Um, had a very long conversation with a great guy named Ed Hussein, who wrote a book called The Islamist about his experience uh, getting sort of sucked in to the extremist uh, underground movement in, in the UK and then coming out of it and, and then sort of you know living to tell the tale, in, in other words. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also had an opportunity to go to places like Leeds, to Bradford, uh, to Bristol, uh, the, the sort of ground zero for the, for the uh, you know, sleeper cell terrorism problem in, in the UK, and talk to some of the family members, friends, neighbors of the 7-7 bombers, because, you know, I really wanted to get, an, get a sense from them as to what they thought that the problem was, and, and try to get something beyond the official accounts of why these seemingly normal, well-integrated, middle-class, uh, you know, Muslim youth, some of whom are actually born in the UK, right. would, uh, you know, perpetrate such a, such a horrific act. And to be perfectly honest, you know, in the end, the one thing that I couldn't, you know, make up for, the one thing that I couldn't give an, get an excuse for mm-hmm. uh, was the fact that, at least when it comes to Mohammed Sadiq Khan, this was a man who seemed to have been radicalized by what he saw outside of the UK, not how he felt inside the UK. So I think in a way, and particularly what happened to him when he went to Palestine, uh, and, he, and he had a, a particularly you know, terrible experience there, and, and came back from it you know, angrier than, than his friends and families had ever seen him. Now how, of course, that you know, righteous anger turns into an un- unrighteous act is something that we can talk about, but I don't I, I, I want to just emphasize that this notion that perhaps foreign policy does have something to do with domestic terrorism, I mean, I don't see why people are so uh, so um, unwilling to accept this as a possibility. Well, I, I'm not unwilling to accept it in, in a sense. I mean, I think it is the foreign policy of certain states to use terrorism as statecraft against, as they see, their geopolitical allies. Also, I think that insofar as the jihadist movement or the people who are obsessed with takfir uh, see themselves as uh, an Ummah or Islamic nation, they see terrorism as a form of warfare. So uh, in f- they're responding to you know, geopolitical issues or grievances that they have, and this is one of the ways in which they respond. Uh, or you know, maybe you could say the, the, you know, one of the main ways that they respond. So, I mean, in that respect, I'm sure that you know, people who are radicalized and who see themselves at war with the West, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as concerned with their grievances. I'm concerned with the fact that they're at war, and this is, this is the way they're waging that war. Well, I'm, I am glad that you are referring to it as a war, because, I mean, I think in their minds they, they really are. And also, it is important for us to sort of differentiate between the jihadists and the so-called Islamists. I mean, these are terms that are passed around a lot, and, and they, they become inflated sometimes. Uh, it, 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 the Islamism is a political philosophy of Islam. It is the notion that Islam is a, is a complete way of life. And it's not just a religion, but it is also an ideology of statecraft, of, of politics, of international relations. And the ultimate goal of Islamism is to create an Islamic state. And that's why Islamists are so vastly different around the world. I mean, in some sense, the Taliban were Islamists, but so is the AKP party in Turkey. And yet, these two groups could not be any more 
different in their ideologies, in their agendas, in their goals, even in their, in their version of Islam. So Islamism is a very wide-ranging term that ultimately gets you know, narrowed down to this belief that Islam should also have a role to play in the political uh, sphere. Jihadism is a completely different ideology. Jihadism is not interested in the Islamic State. In fact, the jihadists believe that the state, the idea of nationality or nationalism, is totally anathema to Islam. Their goal, ultimately, is to get rid of all nation states, all borders. They are a transnationalist organization uh, that wants to create a worldwide unified ummah, as you say, community, headed by a, you know, a, a, a caliphate. Now, we can talk about you know, the lunacy of this idea and whether it's you know, possible or not, but I think it is important to yeah. recognize that there is a distinct difference between these two ideologies. And actually, these two groups, Islamists and Jihadists, are often uh, at war and in, in, in conflict with each other uh, because of their, their differing views. Yeah, well, that's, I think this is a, a point that sometimes is lost in the debate on the U.S. side. And I was fortunate enough to, to live in Cairo where, you know, you, if, you, if you follow it and if you, if you particularly, um, if you sort of follow what the Muslim Brotherhood is now, I don't want to say that they're entirely benign because there is some question among a lot of Egyptians that I know as to whether or not they're uh, agreeing to sort of play by the rules of political competition in Egypt will continue once they have seized power. But, you know, that's, that's for another time. They're, they're clearly different than Gema Islamiya, an organization that, you know, recently allied with Al-Qaeda or Ayman Zawahiri, who is an Egyptian. Uh, and there was a split, I think, after the uh, execution of Said Qutb, who uh, called for, uh, you know, sort of uh, accomplishing political goals for the Muslim Brotherhood through violence. And uh, there is really, there's almost two generations now in Egypt of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, acting, you know, at times, I think, clandestinely, even against what they would see as their jihadist rivals. So yeah, I think you're right that sometimes these things, these, these, these categories do get blurred. Um, that said, uh, I'm wary of, of just sort of saying that, you know, I mean, that I don't necessarily buy all of their propaganda because there are figures within the Muslim Brotherhood that uh, worldwide, like, you know, Yusuf Karadari, um, certainly Hamas to a certain extent that will use terrorism and violence and you know I think it, I think it varies I mean the Muslim Brotherhood leader of the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood uh, Bayanuni I mean he, he is his envoys have met with uh, the National Security Council through the Syrian uh, sort of coalition group uh, you know we, we know that Tariq Rama I'm um, sorry sorry uh, why am I why am I blank uh, Tariq Al Hashimi the vice one of the vice presidents of Iraq. Uh, his party is essentially the Iraqi Muslim Brotherhood, and, you know, he meets with uh, U.S. officials all the time. I think he's met with President Bush. Um, so, I mean, you, you are correct that there is a difference between uh, the movement of Hassan al-Banna and, uh, you know, what might be called, you know, the, the movement of, of Osama bin Laden or, or Ayman al-Zawahiri or the sort of, uh, or jihadism. Well, I would say it's even more than that. I mean, there's no such thing as the Muslim Brotherhood as one worldwide organization, as you know. The Muslim Brotherhood has been uh, has had many, many, many manifestations of, around the world. So the Muslim Brotherhood that Karadawi uh, in, in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, it links himself to is quite different than the Muslim Brotherhood that uh, you see in, in Egypt. Or for that matter, even talking about the AKP party, this, the, the most democratic, the most liberal, the most uh, uh, freedom-loving uh, 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 party, political party that Turkey has ever had in its, in its history, has its roots in the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, but the Muslim Brotherhood is just sort of an idea more than it is an, an organization, and so it has to be dealt with according to each national boundaries, but that's exactly the point, is that the idea behind the Muslim Brotherhood is a deeply nationalist idea. They have no interest in creating a worldwide Muslim uh, body. They're interested in what goes on in, in Egypt. They're interested in what goes on in Syria. And certainly they have well, connections. I mean, they, they help, they other. help other, if one, I mean, Hamas probably wouldn't have started if it weren't for the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. And, and we know... Well, Hamas wouldn't have wouldn't have started if, if the Israelis did not uh, allow it to, to get off the ground as a way of 
of opposing Fatah at the no, time. And I mean, now, I know, I know that story. The guy, and Hamas I know it's the bad saying. guy. It's not as clear cut. I think I can show a much the point, more the causal that, link. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Yeah. The point that I'm trying to make is this: is that constantly looking at the Muslim Brotherhood as sort of like you know the, the Kevin Bacon, the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know, seven degrees of Muslim Brotherhood in the, in the Muslim world, is completely you know misguided. Uh, for instance, saying that Zawahiri has its roots has its roots in the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, that's a totally nonsensical statement. I mean, well, Zawahiri was a, follower was a of, member of, of the Muslim Kutub. Brotherhood. He was a follower of Sayyid yeah, Qutb. Yeah, he was. And that's the other thing, too, is Sayyid Qutb represents a, a minority view within the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, although he's enormously popular outside of the Brotherhood, and, and certainly yeah. his views of, of Islamic revolution uh, are at the heart of what can be referred to as jihadism, no question about it. Uh, but there is a real conflict between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda. And in fact, Zawahiri is the perfect example of this. Here's a man who was part of the Muslim Brotherhood, who had the same agenda as, as the Muslim Brotherhood, and that was focus on the near enemy, create an Islamic state in Egypt. But in joining Al-Qaeda, he has completely reshaped his views. It's no longer the near enemy that he's interested in. It's now the far enemy, the West, the, the Europe. Uh, it's no longer creating an Islamic state that he's interested in. It's now creating a worldwide Islamic polity. And, in that, and because of those views, he has not just broken from the, with the Muslim Brotherhood, but if you read Zawahiri's uh, letters back and forth with members of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they are available in, in yeah. English, um, repeatedly he says, you know, there's, a, there's an argument, there's a fight going back and forth. By the way, I would uh, encourage the, the listeners, if they are interested in this, uh, the difference between these two groups, and more importantly, the difference between Islamists and jihadists, the difference between those who are focusing on the near enemy and trying to create an Islamic state, those who are focusing on the far enemy and trying to create an Islamic global uh, worldwide community, should read Fawaz Gurgis. He's, he's the absolute uh, pro in, in this topic, and he's written a number of articles and, and books about this, including The Far Enemy, which is a great book, and Journey of the Jihadists. Well, I, I just, I want to just, I would, I would just quibble with a couple things. One, um, it's quite, I mean, I think that there is a degree to which the, the the tension between Zawahiri and the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood today is in part a function of the fact that the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood has clearly uh, cooperated with the Egyptian government against uh, Gamas Lamia, his organization. So the, he sees them as Judases. I mean, like so, there's part of that is just bad blood. But if I was a uh, if I was a caliphatist, for lack of a better term, or if I was obsessed with the far enemy in some cave in Afghanistan or Peshawar or wherever, uh, I would view some of the Islamist movements in the Islamic world or in other places as, you know, uh, allies of convenience uh, in that, well, you know, I mean, I, I'm looking at the broader picture, they're looking at the local picture, but we, we generally sort of agree on a lot of the same things. So I don't know if it's as simple as, like, you know, for the reasons that one is focused on you know, the, the, the West and the United States of America and the other is just focused on, say, I don't know, the Indonesian government, that the two could not necessarily link up and, 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 and occasionally cooperate. I mean, this is the nature of warfare. Wouldn't you agree? I think you'd be surprised at the level of animosity between these two groups. I mean, there no, I mean, I mean, I want to I'm, I'm stress, I'm not surprised by the fact that Zawahiri has criticized the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. There's good reason for that, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Is no, I would say... You know, and even the other way around. I mean, look, a lot of these, a lot of these nationalist organizations really see Al Qaeda as part of the problem. In fact, you know, it was Hamas and Hezbollah who were among the first two organizations to issue fatwas against September 11th and against uh, Al Qaeda in general. Not because they disagreed with killing Americans or they disagreed with even jihad in, in the first place, but they thought that this focus was going to hurt their focus and their movement, that they would be lumped into the same category as these jihadists, which they have been, and then ultimately their own particular focus would break, break down. Well, I will say one thing that's very interesting about you know, the difference between the near enemy guys and the far enemy guys is that many of the, these nationalist organizations in Algeria and parts of North Africa, even in, in, in the Far East, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, like Indonesia and Malaysia, mm -hmm. many of them who for decades have been focused on nationalist movements, very much in the Muslim Brotherhood sense, focusing on the near enemy, trying to create an Islamic state, but have been you know, really decimated by, police, by the police forces in these countries, by 
you know, uh, anti-terrorism laws, etc., so that their goals, their movements were basically on the verge of death. Many of them have actually adopted the jihadist uh, mentality and have actually changed their names so that they call themselves Al-Qaeda in Algeria or Al-Qaeda in, in Malaysia, not just because it gives you an instant uh, credibility, in, instant celebrity, uh, but also, in a sense, they are not just adopting the name Al-Qaeda, they're beginning to adopt the ideology of Al-Qaeda because they're seeing very clearly, look, our movement to create an Islamic state has failed. It seems to us, by what we see you know, with this grand clash of civilizations between Islam and the West and this global war on terror, it seems to us that Al-Qaeda is doing pretty good, that this notion of attacking the far enemy is working. So we're going to ad not just adopt their name, we're going to adopt their ideology. This, I think, is an incredibly dangerous issue because the difference between the jihadists and the Islamists is that the Islamists want something. And when you want something, regardless of how loon, you know, crazy what they want it may be, if you want something, you can be talked to, you can be negotiated with. The dirty secret about Al-Qaeda and jihadism is that they don't want anything. Yes, they talk about creating a worldwide caliphate. That's absurd. It's impossible. It will never, ever happen. There is no way they can ever destroy the nation states of the Muslim world and recreate a caliphate. Most Muslims don't even know what a caliphate is, let alone want one. There is no way they can destroy Israel. Israel is the most powerful army in that entire region, one of the most powerful armies in the world. There is no way they're going to bring down human civilization. They, all of their goals, their quote-unquote goals, are impossible to achieve, and they know they're impossible no, rather, to can achieve. Can we back up a couple? Which is why you can't talk to them. But that's the, yeah, yeah. Which is why you cannot negotiate with these guys. You can't talk to them. You can't talk to them about anything. They don't want anything. Can, I, I wanna, can we back up a little bit? Um, uh, first of all, I think it's I can absolutely see how the terrorists could destroy Israel. Um, they would just cause. How how would they do that? How would they do that? Just out of curiosity. Do you want me to tell you? Uh, I'd be happy to tell yeah, you. Yeah, how, how, how would they destroy the most powerful army in the whole of the Middle East? I would, let me explain. A nuclear, a nuclear power? I mean, explain how they would destroy the nuclear power of Israel, okay? Tell me. Very simple. Uh, if you have enough terrorism in Israel to the point where people can't live there and they just leave, I mean, this, was the, this, is, this is laid out in, in one of the memos, I think, that was captured from the Muqaddah. Part of the strategy of the Second Intifada was to create so much terror and to make it so impossible for Israelis to live their normal lives that they would just say, okay, fine, we'll, we'll live in with relatives in Brooklyn for a while. We can't live here because uh, every day, you know, I mean, and, and, and to sort of create the same tragedy that the terrorists have created for so many residents of Baghdad, which is that if you create a kind of constant terror where nobody can do anything in that state, uh, then, uh, you know, the, the Jews will leave. I mean, I think that that's... The, the, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people have talked about this as a strategy, which is that eventually you break the will of the Israelis. So while they, they, they have this, you know, they have nuclear weapons and they have a fantastic, you know, U.S. supplied air force and so forth, uh, and they cannot win, of course, a military uh, battle, which is the reason why they choose terrorism. Because if, if you, you can eventually, I think the idea is break the will of any society if you just make it impossible for someone to feel like they can take their kids to school or, or go to a marketplace. I mean, I, I'm, not saying well, it's, I'm not saying that I can't, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily going to be effective. The Israelis have seemed to certainly uh, counter it, but the, that is, that's the idea that if you... Okay, but what I, I guess what I'm saying yeah. is that that's the plan. It's just, it's about the most pathetic plan in the history of terrorism because it's been going on for 40 years and nothing of the sort has even remotely happened. Israel is still the most powerful economy in the Middle East. It's still the most well-developed social, political, uh, and economic uh, uh, structure, polity in, in that region. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if somebody is moving out of Jerusalem to Brooklyn, they're still sending tens of thousands of dollars back to Jerusalem. So it's not working. I'll tell you. Israel is in danger. There is an existential danger in Israel, no question. But it doesn't have to do with an outside force, and it certainly doesn't have to do with you know, the Arab world, and it certainly does not have to do with Iran. The existential danger in Israel is a demographic one. The fact of the matter is, is that 
if the status quo continues in Israel, and I know we're moving off on another topic, but it's an important one. If the status quo continues in Israel as it is today, there will be no such thing as Israel in 50 years. The Palestinians are having eight kids per family. The Israelis are having barely two. So eventually, Israel is going to have to start thinking about the future much more so than they think about the present. Well, on, yes, on, there on, are certain they, issues. The Israelis have been thinking about this. Listen, the idea and was what, what the, is, the idea was. What's the plan? Build a wall and, and put and put the put the Palestinians on the other side? That ain't gonna work. Well no no no. Hold on. There, first of all, there's only one party in Israel that that favors, you know, a vague form of maledit or transfer. Okay? The there there's no I mean the vast majority of the political parties in Israel do not say that the Palestinians who live in pre sixty seven Israel should move somewhere else. So that's that's the first thing. And the second thing is that um, the Israelis, the, the Israeli right, uh, why did Oslo happen? Well, the real reason that Oslo happened is that after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the thought was that all of the Jews who wanted to leave the Soviet Union would settle on the West Bank and Gaza and that the demographic problem would be averted because there would be a new wave of immigration. And briefly, there was some settlement of the Soviet Jews in the early 90s but then, as soon as they could, they all, you know, opened car washes in New Jersey and whatever. And good for them. They wanted to go to America, and it, the, the, the idea of, uh, you know, owning a convenience store was more enticing than being part of, you know, the, uh, the Jewish state or the first Jewish state since the Bible. Um, and uh, that's what happened. So, in part, one of the reasons why the Israelis agreed to the outlines of a two-state solution in 1993, uh, and really maybe even in Madrid, you could argue in 1991, was because they understood that that you know that was the last you know you know sort of plausible argument for beating those demographic trends. So the way that you know the Israelis sort of I think the Israelis are kind of reconciled to a two-state solution at this point. I think that how you divide Jerusalem or if Jerusalem is divided is certainly a very very uh, thorny issue, and I don't think any Israeli. Is would ever accept the so-called right of return of, you know, uh, Palestinians. But that's, the, I mean, the, the issue of, like, will Israel keep the land it won in the 67 war? Uh, no, it won't. And that's, I don't even think, I mean, especially after Sharon, who was the last holdout on this, uh, you know, unilaterally withdrew from Gaza, I think that they yeah, have dealt with the issue that you just, you just, you just rose. I mean, I, I think that that's... Yeah, but Eli, you know, but... But this isn't about, I'm not talking about a two-state solution. The fact that 79% of Palestinians, according to the latest poll, also accept a two-state solution. Everybody knows that the answer is a two-state solution. Right. That's not the issue. The issue is, what kind of state will Palestine be? If it's the kind of state that is being formed now by right. sort of the de facto borders, Israel is in trouble. It can't just simply have a Palestinian state next to it. It has to have a functioning Palestinian state next to it. And unfortunately, the only people, the only government at least, uh, that, that can uh, assure a, a stable functioning state, a uh, stable functioning Palestinian state, is Israel itself. Um, and I'm not saying, again, that, you know, that there's, you know, a, 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 an issue of right of return, you know, those, those kinds of things. Look, the, the, the roadmap has been, has been written, and everybody knows what has to be done. Everybody knows it's a two-state solution. Everybody knows East Jerusalem has to be part of the Palestinian state. Everybody understands that the right of return has to be mitigated somehow, either financially or, or in some, some way. And everybody knows that there are certain uh, uh, you know, parts of the, the uh, 67 border that can't be returned to Palestine because it's more or less part of Israel, and that will have to be some sort of land swap. The, everybody knows the answer. Uh, it's just a matter of actually putting it in place, and right now. Well, I mean, the party in power, groups, the party that was elected groups. the parliament in, uh, in in January 2006, is a one-state solution party in Hamas. I mean, that's that's a big part of their charter. And I also the Likud, by the way, Likud is a one-state party. No, it's so not a one-state. It's, it's, it's not a one-state solution party. The, the Excuse me. Have you read the Likud Charter? The Likud Charter not only not only rejects the Oslo Accords according to the international boundaries that we have that we have international guidelines that we have said. It rejects the idea that there is even a Palestinian people. It calls them Jordanians. 
It rejects the notion that there is anything called the West Bank or Gaza. It calls it Judea and Samaria. It, it calls for an Eretz Israel and nothing more, which includes, by the way, the Golan Heights. Well, right, so first of all, first of all, Hamas, Reza, Reza, Hamas Reza, Reza, ideology is Hamas, wrong, Hamas, but remember that Zikubu Hamas is, is the not just, The Hamas problem is not just one of their charter, and the last two Likud prime ministers, Netanyahu and, uh, and Sharon, uh, disproved entirely and, and ended up effectively splitting what was left of the Likud party. I mean, I can, I can just say that right. politically, no, but I'm saying, well, what is, what is Hamas? I mean, Hamas has signed, I mean, the prisoners of Hamas signed a document that seemed like they would have a hudna, at least with regards to Jews in pre-67 but that's about it, and then, I mean, everything else that we can get from them at this point, I would say, sort of leads them, to, I mean, I, I don't think you can really compare the two. Um, hold on now, I'm not comparing, okay. hold on, I'm not comparing Hamas and Likud. Right. What I'm saying is, both of them reject a two-state solution, both of them want all of the land to themselves, both of them reject the Oslo Accords. Now, that's a, that's a Likud, fact. No, 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 I'm saying that the, the, saying Likud, the, the, Likud leaders, the leaders of the Likud party since 1998... And you could argue 1996, but 1998, the leaders of the Likud party have accepted a two-state solution. The party really? itself, when it was in their, the party itself, when it was in their... power, Netanyahu signed the Y River Accord. The Y River Accord. Yeah, and then and then he tripled he tripled the the uh, the settlement. So you know you can't just say you're going to accept the Oslo Accord. You have to actually act upon it. And and frankly, he helped arm right, and train the the the, 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 the Authority Preventive Security Services. He, I mean, I'm just saying that. Um, I I mean I agree with you that one of that, that there were numerous problems and one of them was the issues of, of of expanding settlements and so forth. But I think that a lot of times in that discussion, what's lost is that the most irredentist mainstream Israeli political figure in the entire Oslo period said that Israel needed to unilaterally not only withdraw from Gaza, which he did, but also most of the West Bank. Now, that's not a negotiated settlement, but I'm saying that that is a groundbreakingly different... That's a, that, 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 that's a major development in Israeli politics, which we haven't seen reciprocated in Palestinian politics. In fact, if anything, now I would actually kind of maybe argue against this because sort of leading to the next, uh, next topic that I think that the vote in January 2006 really in part was a, was, it was not a vote for the Hamas charter in total. Of course not. It was a vote mainly as a rejection of the Fatah Mafia. Um, so, you know, and I think as I've said on other blogging heads, I think that Islamism would lose in a free competition. Uh, certainly jihadism would probably lose in a free competition, a political competition. But if the choice is between uh, Islamists who are not tainted by the corruption of a state that is supported by the West that steals from the population, then Islamists have a fantastic chance if you open up the process. And, and that, to me, is the real dilemma, because uh, in my experience, uh, there is a lot of deviation and sin in the Islamic world uh, and in the Arab world. And that is a good thing, which is to say that the, 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 that, that it's not a question of should they reconcile with the West or should they reconcile with modern Western culture. They, they, they have to, and they are. And um, it's what, I think when you look at these questions a little bit deeper, most I'm not, I don't know I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not basing this on a scientific point. The people that I've met and I've imagined when I, when I observed the Muslim Brotherhood running for elections in, in Egypt, they did not say, "Vote for us and we'll force your daughter to wear a hijab." They said, "Vote for us and we'll fix." the uh, fact that you don't have any running models. Yeah. You know, look, and, and I just want to say, yeah. first of all, you know, this, Muslims are like everybody else. I mean, the Muslim world is like every other part of the world. There's nothing exceptional about Islam. There's nothing exceptional about Muslim people. They want the same things yeah. as everybody else does. They believe the same way. Their relationship to their religion is just like the relationship to most Christians are. And frankly, according to the Baylor University poll that came out uh, last year, the most comprehensive poll on American religiosity ever done, 46.5% of Americans believe that the federal government should enforce Christian morals upon this country. So it's not just unusual that there are people of faith in the world who want their beliefs and practices to be a part of, of the general uh, you know, law and order of society. That, that goes across any kind of religion. But you are absolutely right 
not just about Palestine, but I would say everywhere else in the Muslim world, that Islamism, when given an opportunity to become a part of the, the marketplace of ideas and to compete in free and fair elections, uh, will always lose. This is true not just in Egypt, not just in Palestine, where again, 79% of the population, after voting overwhelmingly for a party that rejects a two-state solution, then said they accept a two-state solution. So obviously they didn't vote for Hamas because of its ideology. But even some people, Pakistan, I mean, I, it's hard to say. The There's some of it, you can't get away from the fact that Hamas is known for, you know, in part, like the sort of party of authentic suicide bombers and so forth. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say... I, They're a party of resistance. Their entire, I mean, their entire identity yeah. is, is, uh, is based around resistance, which is, by, by the way, why I and, and many others said, look, give Hamas a chance to, to govern, you know, in a limited way, because they will fail miserably on their own. They have no identity except as an opposition, and, and they'll have only one of two choices, either fail or totally moderate their, their, their uh, ideology and probably do the same thing that the Liku did and that is split up into two different parties. Uh, you know, look, again, I don't want, I'm not calling Liku a terrorist organization. Of course not. But the truth is, is that the real difference between the Likud and Hamas is context. The Likud is a legitimate political party led by legitimate politicians in a legitimate state. There is no Palestinian state. There is no legitimate political organization in Palestine. There's no comparison whatsoever between anything that happens in Palestine and anything that happens in Israel because one is a functioning state and the other is not. So, get, you know, if, if there was a state in, in Palestine and if a group like Hamas were to eventually get involved in, in, in political uh, participation, they would have to moderate their behavior, if not ultimately, you know, fracture into into competing groups. Will they still have groups in there that are that are violent and that that want, you know, a full state and will be willing to do anything to to bring it about? Of course, there is. But the the, the question, you know, kind of going back to the Islamic Brotherhood and, and talking about the larger issue of Islamism is that if we're serious about the notion that political participation has the, the, the power not just to moderate extremist tendencies, but that even democratic participation can transform the Arab world. If we're serious about this, if it's not a joke, if it's not just some sort of you know, hypocritical, rhetorical thing that our, that our politicians say, then we have to get ready to deal with Hamas, with Hezbollah, with the Muslim Brotherhood. There is no way around it. You cannot talk about politics in the Muslim world unless you're willing to talk about politics with regard to these religious organizations as well. And out of all those religious organizations that I just mentioned, the best, the most promising, the solution in many ways, is the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And yet, as we've watched them you know, get a little bit of power because we put some, we put some pressure on Mubarak so they were able to actually run for office for once, not as most members of Muslim Brotherhood, but as independents, uh, almost immediately when, when we saw that they did well in the elections, we shut down the entire democratization process in Egypt. And now, if you read the Times, if you read the papers, almost on a daily basis, uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood are being rounded up again. Uh, opposition political parties are being repressed yet again. And Mubarak knows, hey, I did it again. It's what the United Nations Arab Development Report last year referred to as a legitimacy of blackmail. The idea that anti-democratic policies are necessary in countries like Egypt, because if it weren't for Mubarak, hell, the jihadists would take over. That's ridiculous. It, it's, it's not going to happen, and we've fallen for this blackmail for years and years and years, and, and unfortunately what we've done is much worse. We've opened the door to democratic participation and then shut it again. You know, we never should have opened it in the first place if this is what we were going to well, do. Well, it's funny, because I actually agree with, the, with most of what you said. I want to just go back to what you said about Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, I would not treat them as political actors right now for the following reason, particularly Hezbollah. Hezbollah is an armed militia, and in many ways it's a, it's a militia that is not averse to using terrorism. It's a militia that, insofar as it rules its own local areas in southern Lebanon, does so, and we rarely read about this, with an iron fist. And then, you know, Almanar TV is absolutely atrocious. It's hate television. It's, it would be as if, I mean, I think it, in many ways it's, it's, it's comparable to if the Ku Klux Klan had their own television network. Having no, I agree. What? Yeah. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Um, so, 
Um, my, I think that the deal in some ways has to be something like this. If you are committed to waging your battle politically through the political process without violence, then we cannot abide by our client dictators uh, suppressing you capriciously. And I would, argue, I would just add on to what you said, because everything you said, I was in Egypt while all this was going on, is absolutely right. But I would say that the, re the, first, the worst victim of all of this stuff was a guy who was a complete secular oppositionist named Ayman Noor, who was not in That's the right. Islam. And uh, that what we and often... He's still in jail. What, yeah, he's still in jail. And sadly, uh, Ambassador Ricciardoni never visited him in jail. Uh, he never got the kind of international support that uh, Saidi uh, even Ibrahim uh, received. And I would just say that the first to go, the first to go, when we allow for that, as you eloquently said, the blackmail to kind of go on, are the best secular liberals that we're going to need to present the third option between police states and Islamic republics. And um, so we are, we are we're hindering ourselves in the long term, and I would even argue it's somewhat in the short term, when we fall for that kind of equation. Because in many ways, uh, what... Uh, you know, Flint Leverett and Colin Powell and Dick Armitage and George Tenet very much wanted to do after 9-11 is to use the, uh, this sort of constellation of, the, of police states and allies as our, as our proxies against uh, the jihadist phenomenon. Um, and I think that that formula uh, doesn't work. That's not to say that therefore we need to invade other countries, because I certainly don't support that. But the, the formula that says that we can use, um, you know, the Saudi family, the Mubarak family, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, the Hashemites and uh, the Musharrafs as our front line against uh, jihadism and Islamic terrorism is, uh, it's a fool's errand. Part of that's because in the case of Pakistan, you find the dictator will have to make deals, as he did, also, as he has already in all the border frontier provinces, where you effectively have al-Qaeda and the Taliban in control now anyway. So is Pakistan a harbor of, uh, of al-Qaeda? I mean, they, they are harboring terrorists. It says that we recognize he doesn't have the authority through his military and ISI to do anything about it. He fought them. He couldn't, he couldn't do anything about it. He's losing too many guys. He could no longer give the order. So eventually, everybody that we think is our ally will have to accommodate with our worst enemies in that scenario. And I think that the other problem is, is that in the case of Saudi Arabia, num or prominent Saudis are funding with, oil, I mean, with essentially, I guess, oil profits, the worst form of uh, strain of, of, of what I would say the sort of death cult strain of, of Islamism. I don't, or, is, or I'm sorry, jihadism. I like your, your, your analogy there, which is that they're not just sort of funding mosques and Islamic centers and charities that are interested in creating little Sharia states. Uh, or you know Muslim charities and helping you know poor Muslim women. They're 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 funding places that that program young people to become uh, terrorists. And um, so that's another part of the deal. So I mean I just think that it, all around that policy doesn't work. And I just in fairness to Bush, it's really not um, unique to the George W. Bush administration. That has been the modus. Of, that has been how the U.S. has conducted foreign policy in the Middle East and the Islamic world, really since the beginning of the Cold War. That's absolutely right. The main difference, of yeah. course, is that under this administration, there was a promise of something different. Right. You know, it's been, it's been six years. It's been six years since September 11th, and it's been such an, a dramatic six years, and particularly the last two or three years, that we seem to have forgotten what 2002 and 2003 was like. Uh, the fact is, is that when the president said that, you know, he wants to bring democracy to, to Palestine and to Egypt and, you know, to, to the Arab world, to the larger Arab world, Americans scoffed. But the truth is, is that Arabs did not. The Palestinians really believed Bush. The Egyptians especially honestly believed it. They really yeah. thought, wow... Uh, this is going to be different. No more stability over democracy. Yes. This is something that we're very excited about. And they actually took his words, you know, really believed it. And I think that the shock of, of us kind of essentially turning our backs on this, on this project, and a lot of Americans would say we never should have done it in the first place. Fine. That's a perfectly valid argument to make. But if you're going to start the process, 
you cannot suddenly put a stop to it I know. when it doesn't work out the way you want it. I know. Hey, listen, I know. Uh, I, 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 I think that the 2000, I wish he'd never given the speech that I loved, which is the second inaugural in 2005, where he laid all this stuff out. And, and Michael Gerson wrote it. Um, and I just, it's, it, would have, it maybe would have been better had he never given that speech, because we're certainly not moving in that direction. And actually, it's a good segue to get into Iran. I really think, Reza, this has been great so far, by the way, but I really think we're going to disagree on Iran. But I want to... I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I think we're going to disagree on Iran. But, like, give me the argument for engagement. Give me an argument for anything else. The fact is, is that right. for 30 years, we've had the same exact foreign policy towards Iran. Sanction, isolate, contain. With the hope that eventually uh, it'll, it'll bring down the, the regime. Well, the exact opposite has happened. The, this policy has not just entrenched this regime permanently, by the way, in power. It has made democracy a far more distant prospect. It's made the country far more paranoid. It's accelerated its weapons program. Uh, it's done everything you know, that, that we didn't want to happen in, in Iran. So, I mean, just by logic alone, let's just say we failed every day for the last 30 years to make the slightest change in the Iranian government with the policy that we have. How about a different policy? And the only other policy available at this point, especially post-Iraq war, is a policy of limited engagement. And when I say engagement, I want to emphasize something very important here. Yes, it's true that we've begun reaching out to the Iranians. Yes, it's true that we're, we're having these you know, very limited diplomatic ties. And, and quite frankly, we've been talking to Iran for the last 30 years through, yeah, through, back, through back channels. Yeah, but what I mean is sort of officials sit on, you know, on opposite sides of the table and actually have a diplomatic conversation. Those conversations are a total waste of time as long as the primary goal of our policy towards Iran is regime change. This has to be taken off the table, and it has to be taken off the table in a very public pronouncement. Condi Rice needs to step up to the plate and say, we are no longer interested in removing the regime from power in Iran. We just want to engage in Iran with the understanding that, and this is, this is where you and I are going to really, really disagree, with the understanding that Iran is already a democracy. It's just a failed democracy. It already has all of the democratic civilian infrastructures necessary at the grassroots level to create a functioning democratic state, what Iraq never had. So, in other words, we already tried the lop off the head and democracy will suddenly come down from the top to the bottom. That doesn't work. We know that democracy has to go from the bottom up. Well, guess what? In Iran, democracy is already at the bottom. Lopping off the head isn't going to make that suddenly rise to the surface. The only way that we're going to democratize Iran is to let it democratize itself, which it's doing in, in marvelous ways, uh, and which we could encourage, how is, how but is not Iran in the way that we've done so far. Itself? Iran has the freest and fairest elections in the whole of the Arab world. There is not a single ally that we have in that region, outside of Israel, obviously, um, and Turkey, uh, that has freer and fairer elections, that has a most robust de democratic state, that has a, a, a stronger constitutional framework, that has uh, you know, a, a, a more vibrant women's rights movement, a more vibrant human rights movement. Uh, all of the political parties, the discussions that take place about what Iran should and should not do, you know, the, the, the most, I mean, this is where the vibrancy of grassroots democracy exists more so than it exists anywhere else. Now, granted, all of this is being, you know, overshadowed by this unelected shadow government, no question about it. Right, but the fact is, is that, in, like that, yeah, I would, I would go, I would go that, further than that. Uh, I've been to Iran once. I think you've been more than I have, and you, I think you are a Persian, correct? I was born there, yes, I was born in Iran. Um, I mean, listen, as I see it, first of all, the Clinton administration and the beginning of the Bush administration, there was a pretty serious effort to engage with Iranian reformers. I mean, would you agree with that? We lifted some of the sanctions. Yes. We began a series of serious... In the Clinton administration, not in the Bush Oh, no, no, but the Bush administration the continued it. I mean, after the UN Millennium Summit, there was, a, there was a policy of the State Department at the time 
where we had numerous contacts with the Iranians. Uh, I could go through them, uh, but we met with them in The Hague through the settling of claims. There was a lot of different channels where we met with them. We believed that their President Hatemi, as a reformer, was taking the country in the right direction and that he was worth bolstering. And, and furthermore, we, were, we, were, we, we believed that a lot of Iranians supported the idea of better relationships with the United States, which I think is still true. Most Iranians do would like a better relationship with the United States, certainly. The vast majority. Um, now, what happened? Uh, now, it depends on where you start. But first of all, when a lot of this was going on, we you know, if you remember, Madeleine Albright apologized for the U.S. CIA role in, uh, in the overthrow of most of By the way, a little irony of history for all of our leftist viewers. Do you know who supported the uh, Shah's takeover in 1953, Reza? The Ayatollahs in Qom. FYI, just saying they, they weren't such revolutionaries back then. You know, it's a fact. I'm not, I'm not saying it was the right idea in 53. I'm just saying it's sort of like lost on a lot of people. That at the time, the clerical establishment in Qom supported, supported the Shah along with the CIA and the MI6 and didn't like most of it for other political reasons. I get off in a little bit. Yeah, way. great. So we, we lined ourselves with Qom. That was a great idea. No, it was a terrible idea. I'm just saying that it was, uh, that at the time, I'm just saying it's, an, it's a little of a historical irony. Um, but anyway, more to the point. In 1999, uh, we saw the Tehran University uprising, okay, which is still an important event for Iranian Democrats. Okay, I, the, the numbers of how many people ended up going to jail and being tortured are sketchy. We don't really know because in a lot of ways we don't have a lot of transparency because photographers like Zara Kazemi are literally raped and killed in prisons. Um, now, some would argue that in 99, at that moment, when Khatami could do nothing to stop it, or depending on who you talk to, possibly can continue on, that he wasn't serious about reform. But you know what? A lot of people could say that he could do nothing to stop it, and he still was worthwhile in this whole process to kind of keep going. Uh, fast forward, they arrest Akbar Ganji, ostensibly for writing the book that accused Rafsanjani of orchestrating the chain murders, not to mention uh, attending a conference uh, you know, with the government of Germany in Berlin, okay, which was perfectly allowed, but they sort of, the rules had changed. But this is a moment of, of engagement where there's a, lot of, there's a lot of hope to sort of do this sort of thing. So moving on and on and on. And then we finally get to 2001 when uh, there's out, outgrowth of sympathy among a lot of Iranians in the soccer match for 9-11, and the foreign ministry at least agrees to help us in Afghanistan, participates in the Bonn Conference. But at this point, you know, at least the military, and this is not the neocons, this is the military, and the 9-11 report actually kind of confirms that, that there was a separate policy from the Iranian uh, Quds Force and parts of the IRGC to allow al-Qaeda to essential elements of al-Qaeda. And I'm specifically thinking of, um, of uh, oh, why am I forgetting his name right now? Anyway, but the number three military guy in al-Qaeda. But people began to go to Iran. It's unclear whether they're arrested or not arrested or whatever, but it becomes clear at that point that there is a policy, at least for some elements of the Iranian regime, to work with al-Qaeda. And this, as I said before, is in the 9-11 Commission report, and that then creates a debate on whether this sort of uh, back and forth with the Iranians, and in some ways leads to the pronouncement in the Axis of Evil speech, or Iran being part of that Axis of Evil uh, speech. At that point, and I'm trying to be as fair as I can here, because I mean, I don't want to make a kind of rhetorical point. You could argue that the Iranians hear their name in the Axis of Evil, and then suddenly turn on the reform movement. Um, that's certainly one explanation of what happens. But the year 2002 is a very bad one for Khatami and all of the reformers because the unelected side of the, of the regime then really starts to turn on them. I don't think it's as simple as they were included in the Axis of Evil. There were tons of contacts throughout, 19, throughout 2002. We were working with ostensibly their proxies in Dawa and what at the time was called the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq. And there was a lot of contact, and we were about to invade Iraq, which at the time was actually seen as a fairly good thing from the eyes of uh, the Iranians. Um, and uh, they assisted us to a certain degree because the groups that they helped train were brought in and became eventually part of the government. Uh, possibly not the best idea in retrospect, but that's what ended up happening. But the point is that in 2002 and then 2003, we really see what is the beginnings of a slow-motion coup d'etat. People like Abbas Abdi at the end of 2002 are really put, are put on trial, a show trial, a public trial for espionage, uh, for assisting in a, uh, in a poll with the Gallup organization 
that showed Iranians wanted better relations with the United States. And I might add that, that Abdi, as you know, is, is a close associate of Khatami, and at that point is also doing work for the foreign ministry. So that all of the people that we'd reached out to among the reformers are being treated as spies at this point. Um, and then at the end of 2003, because you still have reformists in, in, the, in the Majlis, what are they doing? They're saying, we would like to challenge the authority of the Supreme Leader and the Guardian Council to overturn the reforms that we're trying to pass, which was always a problem, because they would pass laws, as you know, and then they would be vetoed. And then as soon as they did that, 2003, 2004, we were told that all of these reformers associated with Khatami could no longer run for re-election. They just weren't allowed to stand for re-election. This, you know, among a lot of people, prompted boycotts. Um, you know, at this point, you know, later on, people like Ramin Jahanbeglu, the author of the Dialogue of Civilization speech, is arrested. And I think what we're seeing is just, you know, everybody who wanted to make Iran, as you say, more democratic, has been squashed under the boot of, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the hardline kind of terrorist revolutionaries. Um, and I don't think that that's because Bush gave a speech in 2002. I think it's because they know they face a legitimation crisis in Iran and that most Iranians think their nutty and aesthetic, you know, view of Shiism and the role of Shiism and clerics in the state is insane. And that if they had their druthers... Lost you, like what? Did you, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You there? Yeah. Are you there? Uh, I lost your phone line for a second. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Just, uh, just anyway, what I was going to say is I think that they see the more, the, 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 the sort of using Occam's razor, the, razor, the more straightforward reason why all of these Democrats have been uh, arrested, uh, ostensibly exiled, and so forth, and uh, why they will not let anybody who wants to do the sorts of things that Khatami in 97 originally ran on uh, is because they are afraid that they will win not just a little bit, but overwhelmingly. And that the original ideals of the revolution, uh, not the democratic part, but the Islamism part and the Islamic Republic part, will be rejected by millions of their people. And they want to avoid that in any way. So what they're doing now is they're trying to provoke a war with America. But they also are trying to destroy and kill anybody or uh, exile and sideline or co-opt anybody who is a real challenge to it. And this is how, this is traditionally how we see the sort of most excessive phases of totalitarian and fascist states come to power, which is at, the, at this sort of moment. Now, uh, so I said everybody that we were talking to before is squashed at this point. Wouldn't you agree, Reza? I mean, like, who, who are we supposed to talk to? I mean, they're arresting people let who me, work for me, George Soros, Bush's number one enemy. This is ridiculous. Let me let me let me just let me just answer some of these points. Okay. Uh, first of all, the Al Qaeda thing is very important, and, yeah. and what you said is correct. But you didn't say the coda to it, which is after the United States invaded I Iraq, they they gathered together the the members of the Mujahideen al Khalq, a, a terrorist Marxist cult. Uh, on the terrorist watch list of both the EU and the United States, responsible for the deaths of dozens of Americans, by the way, not just Iranians. And the Iranians made a very public offer to the Americans. We have senior members of Al-Qaeda in our, in our right. possession. So whether they were in jail or not, they were still nonetheless monitored in some way or another. We will give you your terrorists if you give us ours. That deal was almost a few days from being inked when it was, a stop was put to it by, of course, Dick Cheney's office. Yeah, really because the Cheney. idea was, since we're going to move on to Iran eventually, we need the Mujahideen. That was not, that was not so the idea. This terrorist organization, Eli, this is the only terrorist organization in the world with offices in downtown Washington, D.C., next to the Treasury Department, and an open door to some of the most senior figures of this administration. So let's, let's think about that for a second. The MEK does not meet with senior figures of this administration. Do you want me to name them? Yes. John Ashcroft has actually given speeches to the MEK. Tom Tancredo, who's, by the way, running for office, yeah, Tom has Tancredo received is a 300 yeah thousand dollars worth of, of, John Ashcroft wasn't part of the administration, John Ashcroft was one of the MEK's closest uh, followers, uh, uh, and not just, by the way, not just in not the administration, general, but the entire, your entire circle, I mean, maybe you ought to talk to Elliot Abrams, uh, maybe you ought to talk to, uh, uh, you know, 
We'll talk to them about their, their views of the MBK, and I think, I think you'd I, be surprised. I, mean, I, but, I'm just saying, but, I have talked to them. There are people who have – I agree with you about the MEK. I'm not a, an MEK fan, okay? Um, but most of the people who – people think that they wanted to use the MEK and so forth, and we can get it. There's a separate question about – there are certainly people who want to use the MEK as Iranian contras. That is certainly true, Okay. But the reason that they that I was told at the time by the State Department that they did not go through with this deal is because they, uh, you know, they didn't like the idea that they had to give something up to any country in the world when you're with us or against us for senior Al Qaeda leaders. And also, I might add, because the Saudis at the time provided us with a taped conversation uh, between the senior Al Qaeda folks and the military folks, um, I'm going to find this. I'm, I don't understand why I'm blanking right now on his name, but uh, they found basically him on tape, you know, communicating with a cell in Saudi Arabia. And this is also, you know, I think this, it's not as simple as like, you know, they just they wanted to invade Iran, so therefore, I mean, they didn't they didn't necessarily want to invade Iran. No, no. The point that I'm trying to make the point that I'm trying to make the point that I'm trying to make is that you're somehow like emphasizing this relationship between Iran and Al Qaeda. The fact is, is that the notion that my enemy's enemy can possibly be my friend or could be useful to me is a universal notion, and we and the the MEK is a perfect example of, of us doing the exact same thing. We are harboring terrorists. We are participating with terrorists. And frankly, I'd like to know exactly how much of that 75 million dollars that Condi Rice demanded uh, is going to MEK people. That's that's a question that hasn't been answered. Uh, uh, well, I'd like, I'd like to find out exactly how much is that there, money If MEK is getting any money from the United gone. States, it's coming out of a black budget. So it's not coming out of the... the it's, 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 it's nevertheless, nevertheless, nevertheless I, think, I think the point, the point that I'm making is, is clear enough, and that is that it's not unusual to, to use your enemy's enemy as your friend. But I don't think it's comparable that like, they really have terrorists and we have terrorists. I mean, I think you're talking about like the Henry Ford of Islamic terrorism. I mean, they're, they're, they are. That's, that's the Iranians. The Iranians, like, are, are, like, pioneers in modern Islamic terrorism. At the regime, not the people. I'm just saying that the regime well, what, what is... is yeah, the, Hold on. What? Hold on. But what does that have to do... What, what does that have to do with anything that, that I'm referring to here? We're, we're talking about, you know, the relationship between Iran and Al-Qaeda, uh, if there is a relationship, know, which is probably about as much Iran. as... As much as that they're using, as much as that they're using, you know, Al Qaeda members in order to to promote their national national interests uh, uh, against uh, the United States, we're using Iranian terrorists to promote our national interests against Iran. And you've read the reports. You know that there are uh, in Baluchistan uh, members of MEK that have been. But for what it's worth, I broke I broke the offer of the MEK for Al Qaeda story for UPI when it when it happened. Anyway. But. Uh, well, anyway, the, the, let's go back for just yeah. a second here because I think there's a larger point yeah. about Iran that, that's, that's getting mi mixed up here. Look, I think that there is this sort of idea that somehow the Khatami revolution was this disastrous failure that really proved uh, a huge lesson that reform is impossible in Iran and that the only way that we can ever deal with Iran is by getting rid of the government. That's absurd. The Iran today has no resemblance whatsoever to the Iran of 1997. Every single policy, social policy, that Khatami tried to bring about in that country, from the, the, the loosening of, of the, the dress codes, from the loosening of, of relationship codes, uh, from the number of books and articles that you could read, the issues with the, the, the press openings, all of those things are still in place today. Yet no question that that revolution or that movement towards reform didn't actually reach the stage of revolution, maybe because Khatami couldn't do it, maybe because he didn't want to do it, as some people say. But the point is, is that the reform, is, the, the reform uh, principles that he put into place, as Rasanjani himself said during the last elections, are irreversible. There's no going back. Yes, there's going to be, you know, clampdowns occasionally. Every spring there's a clampdown in Iran about, you know, hijab. But it goes away. And the Iranians who live in Iran today are... Have, have a life that's vastly different than they did uh, before the, the Reformation, uh, the movement towards reform. So, so again, the point is, is that we can talk about whether it was successful or not, but, but true change in Iran is going to come 
gradually, and it's going to come from within. And it did do that. So part of the reason why you know you're seeing such a clampdown and such a sort of a, a, a reversal and, 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 a, and, a, and a, a, a clampdown on the opposition forces and the reform forces there is because of how successful the reform forces actually were. Now the point is, is they weren't necessarily successful because the United States reached out to them. That's not why Khatami succeeded. In fact. Partly, as you yourself suggested, it's why it, he sort of failed in some ways. Everybody that we've reached out to over there is either in jail or, or dead or, or has, has you know, become completely clamped down uh, by, the, by the clerical regime. Our goal is not to create democracy in Iran. Iran is going to do fine on its own. The real issue in Iran is not one about sort of political domination or, or even Islamic law. When you talk to Iranians on the street, they don't say this is the primary problem. To a person, regardless of your piety or regardless of your politics, people in Iran say the problem with Iran is the economy. The problem with Iran is the 30% unemployment rate, that 40% live under the poverty line, that there's a 24% inflation rate every year. The, the issue, and, and you said it yourself, the way that a tyrant stays in power is by isolating his people. And these tyrants have done a marvelous job of isolating their people because they've got enormous help from the United States over the last 30 years to do so. Uh, it, what we need to do is break through that isolation gradually, slowly, uh, do so in, 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 a, in a responsible way through interdependent trade relations, the way we broke through China, the way we broke through the Soviet Union, and more importantly, the way that we have done in every other country in the world, in Latin America, in the former Eastern, uh, in the former Soviet blocs, in, in, in Africa, uh, countries that have a democratic infrastructure, but one that has been completely uh, hijacked by you know, a, an autocratic regime. We don't talk about regime change in those countries. We do whatever we can in order to foster the, the democratic uh, movements on the ground while trying to uh, do away with the autocratic tendencies well, of those we, countries. We don't talk about Why regime we don't do that to the Iran most important either. country in the Middle East? This is the most important country in the Middle East, and we cannot continue to act as though it's some sort of rogue nation on the verge of collapse. Well, first, it's like not. The regime, it's is, the regime is a rogue nation. I mean, it, I think it, it's folly to expect them to live up to any of their agreements. And it's also, we need to... In 2003, 2003 they sent a comprehensive uh, a, a statement of negotiations which said that they would not only stop supporting Hezbollah, but they would actually uh, allow the Palestinians uh, to, to essentially create their own state without any help from them, uh, and we ignored it. Uh, so they look, didn't send the that. Fact is, is that, that those are the, that's the notes of Tim Goldman, who, if you look into... Tim Goldman also thinks that, you know, Israel has nothing to fear from Iran's nuclear program, and he says a lot of things. And diplomats like agreements, and they love to sort of, you know, I, I, I don't. And, and also, these I would are, say these everybody, are including points, Eli, um, that I'm sure you've seen yourself. Richard, you've Richard seen Armitage has said that 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 this notion that there was a comprehensive agreement that was offered from the Iranians, and it was anything that we could sort of trust, at a moment when you know we had, you know, a tape of Saif al Adil on the phone with terrorists in Saudi Arabia from Lavazan prison, who was allegedly under house arrest. Um, you know, it's it sort of, it, it's, it's, I, mean, I just, I think that there's a lot that we don't know about that, and I don't think that the, um, the Goldman uh, version of that is what happened. But more importantly, um, this regime is, is literally at war with our soldiers in Iraq right now. I mean, at least according to General Petraeus. That's absurd. Okay, well then, well then we, then we're at war, then we're at war with Syria, and we're at war with Saudi Arabia then. So Saudi Arabia and Syria are also at war with us. Well, no, no, but I'm saying right. that, 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 that if you send agents of your country to literally kidnap American soldiers in Karbala and then execute them and dump them on the side of the road, which is what Petraeus has just sort of said we have them dead to rights on, and uh, I have a feeling that a lot more of this kind of evidence is going to be out. And that's according to the people that are fighting the war in Iraq right now, Reza. Those are the, right, that's so that's the generals on the ground. So no, no, no. I mean, I'm just saying if that's the case, then that alone. But let's, let's look at them. I mean, they, they, they have failed to agree to, to live up to the terms of their 2003 agreement uh, with the IAEA. They're continuing to enrich uranium. I think we would all agree that, you know, this regime of these, you know, terrorist clerics, cleric, clerical scum, you know, that we don't want them to get nuclear weapons. I mean, it's bad enough that Musharraf has nuclear weapons. We certainly don't want 
you know, the, the, the you know, Khamenei um, and, and these people have, I mean, everything they do. I would argue that in 2005, it was, it was a non-election. Um, it, was, it, was, it was both fixed and meaningless. Um, you know, three of Ahmadinejad's rivals complained publicly that this guy, you know, had essentially, that, that, that the election had been fixed. Their complaints when they ran in newspapers, those newspapers were shut down. Um, I think that you're seeing an effort on the part of the people who are in power to crush dissent at home and to declare war on the world. They are drunk on some sort of millenary in power. They have some sort of, I agree with you, tactical alliance with al-Qaeda, certainly not a deep kind of ideological one. Um, you know, they're, they're engaged in war. And this is, says nothing of the fact that the UN itself has them, you know, shipping arms to the Islamic Courts Union. Uh, you know, the Israelis claim that the Iranians are involved in, 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 in a lot of ways in supporting the military side of Hamas in Gaza. Uh, and on and on and on it goes. Um, yeah, but Eli, of course they are. Of course they are. Right. Look, well, then, the then well, okay, the well, I'm just saying, what's, nation, what's wrong with this policy? If war is what you want, regime. War is what you'll get. And to the Iranian people, um, hey, this, this cannot so hold. So we're not, I, imagine, I, mean, I, mean, I imagine that I imagine that any day now we're going to start bombing Syria and we're going to start bombing Saudi Arabia because while it is true that Iranian arms have killed some 250 Americans, about 3,000 of them have been killed by Sunnis, the vast majority of whom are coming through Syria and Saudi Arabia without any kind of stoppage from either of those countries. Well, I would, agree, I would argue that, 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 that the Syrians are also so playing let's, along, let's but I'm bomb, saying that... Let's bomb Saudi Arabia and Syria. Well, the difference no, is that the the Saudi, at least the Saudi government, uh, at least nominally you know, sort of, you know, will at least try to take efforts to support us. So I agree with you that the Saudis are playing a double game as well. And the real gripe that people should have is that the Iraqi people should, um, should have a serious problem with uh, the Iranian regime, and particularly uh, their, their the, quits for the it. But, I'm saying, but these, I mean, I'm just saying that when, you, when you're talking about acts of war like this, it's kind of foolish no, to think that this, this is the very moment that you offer uh, to have to, 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 to sort of sit down and negotiate normalization. And I would argue, I would just to sort of say a point in your favor, we would be a more effective advocate for democracy if we didn't have a hostile relationship with the Iranians. But I blame these, the, the regime in large part because there's a long history of this. Come on, listen, you go through the record at almost every point. You have the Mykonos, you know, massacres that, and you go, go to the German court documents in 92. You have Vienna in 89. The president right now was, you know, I mean, I hate it when people say, Amani Nijad is a far right winger, just like Bush is a far right winger. It's absurd. George W. Bush, you know, wasn't in charge of assassination squads for the CIA. His dad was the head of the CIA, but it's not even close. The CIA does is not even anything like the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Um, you know, th this is a state that's clearly a, uh, it's a piracy state. They don't play by the rules of international law. We weaken the institution of international law if we expect that this particular regime is going to keep its word after it clearly violates everything it says it's going to do or lies to us so many times. So, I mean, if, if you care about international law, if you care about, uh, you know, the, 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 the unity and peace of Iraq, if you care about uh, American security, if you care about the security of our soldiers, then you, you have to do something about this regime. And I think we're well beyond the point of pretending that, you know, if we spoke to them nicely, they would, they would change their behavior. And we're also well beyond the point of saying that international law is somehow the, the, the standard by which all countries should be judged, because if that's the case, I think you know where I'm going with this. The point is this. Look, Iran obviously supports terrorism. It obviously supports Hezbollah. It obviously sends arms to Hamas. There's no question about it. No question that it's got agents in Iraq uh, doing, doing Iran's bidding and that they're sending arms to, to Iraq. That's, that's, there's no question about it. My answer to you is, and the point is, is that every country in the world is going to do whatever it takes, break any kind of international laws in order to secure its own interests. In this case, Iran is literally surrounded by American troops. Literally, all sides, it's surrounded by American troops. It's surrounded by the troops of a country that for 30 years has had one goal and one goal only with regard to Iran, bring down the government. Of course, Iran is going to do whatever legal or illegal issues that it can in order to avoid that, that, that kind of uh, product. The one thing that I will tell you about the clerical regime, as despicable as they are, they're not irrational. In fact, far from it. This, I, I, don't, I, I don't think they're irrational. That this clerical regime, yeah. If there's one thing that this regime 
cares about more than anything else, more than Islam, yeah. more than you know Iranian nationality, whatever, is survival. And they know how to survive. I mean, how do you survive in a country in which everybody loathes you? Uh, you survive by making sure that you bend but do not break. This regime knows how to stay in power, and it will do whatever it takes, legal and illegal, in order to stay in power. Now, I'm not going to sit here and excuse Iran's actions. Absolutely no, no way to it. And, and nor am I going to say that Iran doesn't want nuclear weapons. Of course it wants nuclear weapons. I mean, it has learned a valuable lesson from its fellow Axis of Evil members. One didn't have nuclear weapons, and it was destroyed. One does have nuclear weapons, and we're pouring money at it and begging it to please, please talk to us. Yeah. So, I mean, what would you do if you were Iran? But beyond all of that, we have to get to this one fundamental question. What is the option what else is there to do? You know well, can I, that can there I, is no military option to Iran. There is no military well, we option. Can't invade Iran, like certainly, there is. certainly. I, I, listen, um, a couple things. You said something before about how for 30 years America has been trying to destroy Iran, and I just don't think that's true. Take down the regime. Take, take how has it been trying to destroy, destroy Iran? And trying to take down the regime. I mean, in 1981... Regime change... Eli, regime change has been our fundamental goal in Iran since 1980. No, what, I, I mean, mean you, we how, signed the Algiers Accord in 1981. And in, that, in the Algiers Accord, we agreed that we were going to take a policy of non-interference. That was at least the official policy. In 1983, 1984, we began, or with the Israelis, of selling tow missiles against our own embargoes, as it were, uh, to the Iranians, which was enacted and ended up probably prolonging the Iran-Iraq war um, in the 19... Really, I know, I know, we both know the history, but I just... Well, want I'm to just saying, if you question, sell, if you you sell a country, me, if you, you sell a country... Our goal, our goal, our goal in Iran has not always been regime change, and I would even argue that under George W. Bush, it's not been regime change. What he said is, we support the democracy activists, and he's, he's made funds available. Now... Uh, if the ABC report... Now, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Hold on. If you say you support democracy activists in Iran, and, and I'm sorry, but our goal is to remove the regime out of, from power, what you're saying is not, hey, we would love to see Iran become more democratic. If that's what you really would love to see, then do what the demo democratic uh, reformers in Iran tell you to do, which is leave them alone. Stop reaching out to them. If you want to help us, help us economically. Open up the country. So it's not so much that we want to help the democratic regime or the you know democracy flourish in Iran. When we say we want to support the democratic regime or the democratic uh, movements in Iran, we mean the opposition. In other words, we mean those movements who essentially, almost by definition, uh, mean the end of this clerical regime. We have the president signing a presidential directive essentially saying that we are going to, uh, to promote black operations in Iran. We have the, the, uh, a, a, an aide to the White House say to the Irish Times unequivocally, we're going to reach out to Iranian Americans living in the United States who go back and forth between Iran and the United States as a means of using them to, to have two-way communications with Iran in order to gain in, you know, intelligence about, about uh, the, the Islamic Republic. And then we're surprised when, for no reason whatsoever, and without, without justification, the Iranians round up and arrest Iranian Americans and throw them in jail and accuse them right, of spying. Right, I'm, glad, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. Listen, first of all, the Iranians do this too, okay? Uh, and we don't just randomly arrest Iranians. Of course they do. All nations do this. No, All no, nations well, the, no, no, the Iranians. The Iranians, though, decide to sort of make a political issue out of it because they're, you know, they are, as I, as I think I've said in another dialogue, a nation of hostage takers. Secondly, we support Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, or Myanmar today, I guess as it's called. We support democracy activists in China. We support democracy activists in Saudi Arabia, though I don't even know if they're really democracy activists. In but in none, none in of those Egypt. countries have we said we want to regime change. But we've and never said we want the regime, regime change, change in Iran. That's what I'm saying is that, like, I'm I... Sorry, did you, wait, 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 wait. Did you just say we've never said we want regime change in Iran? It's been a major policy debate, Reza, for a long time, and never has there been a policy of we are going to take steps necessary to topple the Iranian regime. In fact, it is one of the main... What do you call the Iran Liberation Act? What about the Iran Liberation Act? The Iran I mean, Liberation Act, I might add, changed... Hold on. The Iran Liberation Act, which is in Congress right now, okay, which has not been signed into law, but the original Iran Liberation Act, when it was being worked on by Rick Santorum, the White House specifically said, change the language from regime change because we will not sign it. 
Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to mince words here, but I'm saying in their complicated relationship with the Iranians, whereas recently as 2003 and 2002, we were working with them in both the reconstruction discussions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it's not necessarily I don't I don't think it necessarily buys I don't buy the argument that we for 30 years wanted to change the regime. It's sort of a bit of a paranoid view. Now, I think that the Moas are should be very frightened of democratic activists in Iran. For what it's worth, we both know that a lot of the democratic activists in Tehran right now won't take a dime of our money because it's perilous to do so. But I'm saying for the Iran... Actually, not, not, a, not a penny of American of that money has been taken by any Iranian in Iran. Not a penny of the $75 million. Do you know that for a fact? I'm, I've, I've, I'm, not, dis, I'm not disagreeing I with you. I'm just saying I've, fact, I've been looking actually. into that and I've gotten mixed different, different answers from different people. But... Um, you know, I, I, I'll, I will take your, your word for it. Um, you know, but anyway, that's more evidence in my favor, which is to say that in terms of a policy of regime change. Now, let's talk, though, about the secret initiative, because I think that, you know, it's been reported. I think that's probably right. Um, you know, what do you think that's aimed for? I mean, listen, let's, what's the best possible scenario on, uh, in Iran? I think we would both agree would be an election, a free election where the with the parties of, of, you know, clerical fascism are voted out of power, and you then, you know, have a, a kind of entente with a new regime. Correct? Would that be the best? That's the best. That's but let's talk about the most likely. Right, okay, that's death. the best. I agree with you. That right now, sadly, is not likely, okay, though we would agree that that would be the best outcome. So if you have to deal with, as Ken Pollock says, the ticking clocks of Iranian revolution or democratic revolution and then the ticking clock of the Iranian nuclear program, um, I think you shouldn't have, I think it would be a disaster if Iran, if the, if the clerics did get uh, a nuke, I think it would end up having an effect of extending the life of the regime, which I would like to see expire as quickly as possible, and I think it would be a, a threat, though I don't think that they would, they would launch a first strike against Israel, but it would be a deterrent for them to, to okay. ramp up their sponsorship of international terrorism. So I have a lot of problems. And it would start a, it would start a nuclear race in the region as well. And That's start a nuclear, sure, about. start a nuclear race in the region. It, it would be very, very bad. Um, so, if you want to stop that program or retard that program or whatever, um, I think that, that the main meaning of that is to have some sort of, uh, you know, quote-unquote uh, industrial uh, accident. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's I like mean, one of those I things where they... Saying, but like, I'm saying but that, that's, that's obviously you're what, the, what like they want. a John le Carre novel or something. What? You're, you're talking like we're talking about a John le Carre novel. Let's talk about the, the, the realistic issue. We're not going to bomb Iran out of its nuclear program. That's impossible. Everybody will say the same thing. Maybe, maybe we'll slow it down. I don't even think we'll slow it down. I think we'll accelerate it if we, if we try to, to bomb them. There's no stopping Iran's nuclear oh, civilian sure nuclear program. Sure. There is no stopping it. There is no stopping their civilian nuclear program. We will not stop Iran enrich, enriching uranium. We're not going to do it through sanctions because Russia will step in, China will step in, India will step in. We're not going to do it through the military. Even if we knew where all of their nuclear facilities were, we probably wouldn't be able to, to, to reach them in, a, in an airstrike. In any case, the consequences of that would be enormous, as you hence, know, the global consequences the of it. Finding so what's the other option? The black, the black ops. That's, what, that's hence the Bush finding. That's what I think it's about. I think this is primarily the aimed at... But, but as we know, but as, 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 as you yourself know, the Council on Foreign Relations just did a, a report on this, uh, that hasn't stopped, that hasn't retarded the, the, the enrichment of uranium. Quite the contrary. The more we sit around talking about, uh, we will talk to you about your nuclear program, but only when you completely stop, the more advanced their nuclear program gets. And they're perfectly happy to just drag this on all over and over again. Just keep, let's just keep waiting well, and waiting and, and waiting more and until more they pass will the find, point of More no and more they will find that their, 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 their major banks will not be able to trade in euros and dollars. And uh, who knows? There might be some Iranian uh, you know, labs that uh, suddenly... I know, I know that I this know. is... I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Know, who knows what will happen in Iran? Look, I know this is the neoconservative fantasy. It's not a neoconservative fantasy. It is, it's, I'm saying it's a bad well, option well, of, of a lot of bad choices, but, you know, that's no, what that's what about. Is, okay? We should, like, be adults about it. The neoconservative fantasy is that somehow the Iranians are going to one day, if just pushed far enough, they're going to rise up and bring down the regime. That's, that's Those not, days that's not, are that's, over. That, Reza, don't twist what I said. I don't think that what President Bush signed on the secret side has anything to do with regime change. If indeed, it, it, it's, it's in fact, it probably is not good for regime change because it's fairly an open secret because other people have reported it, 
that it, you know, we're, we're trying to do things to sabotage their nuclear program, then they will see any kind of aid that America might give other people for good reasons. So I have no, I have no under no illusions that this helps me to get to my long-term goal of a free election that ousts, you know, the, or, or some sort of nonviolent revolution that ushers in an era of transparency and democracy and liberalism in Iran, which I think would agree with most of the Iranian people. I'm saying that in the meantime, you do have this sort of really important short-term problem. Now, you could, I agree with you that if, I, my problem with bombing them, though, and I don't think you need, by the way, a tactical nuke to bomb the nuclear programs, even if they're buried underground. I've heard other scenarios where you wouldn't need that. But I think that part of what, you know, what people are talking about is to use whoever they can to sort of infiltrate the program, and sure. And by the way, if we didn't think this was going on, then we would all be naive. I'm not saying it's, it's an ideal solution, but do you think that at this point, like they've made it very clear, they agreed at one point to a freeze and to some sort of negotiations, and then they backed out of it. You know, I mean, they, the Iranians don't live by their word. They never allowed the kind of unfettered inspections that was a condition of their 2003 agreement. I mean, it's, I think it's folly to think... I mean, yeah, no, uh, look, absolutely. Right. They've lied and cheated yeah, their yeah, way through the last 18 years. No, there's, I mean, who's going to doubt that? Right. But the point is, is that everything that Iran does is predicated on the notion that they believe that they are next. I mean, you were in Iran. You talk to Iranians. They think the bombs are going to drop any minute now. They're, they're convinced that they're, going, they're next on the axis of evil list. And they will do anything to ward that off. And nuclear weapons is part of that. As long as they think that the, the regime is in danger and that the United States... And, okay, let's just take your idea that maybe regime change hasn't been the goal of the last 30 years, which I completely disagree with. That's what Iran thinks. And I would say that's what most of the world thinks. Uh, and unless we're willing to say unequivocally, look, the, the policy of the United States government is not to bring down the Iranian government. The policy of the United States government is to keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons and to stop its support of terrorist organizations. Both those things can be done without the larger umbrella of remove this regime, remove this regime. Because the fact of the matter is, you're talking about a country... I've already said, you know, the, the, the incredible democratic grassroots on the, on the ground. Um, and we're, we've been cut off, so this will probably have to be the last statement that I say. But we're talking about a country in which 70% of the population is under the age of 30. The most pro-Western, pro-democratic country in, in, the, in the Middle East, outside of Israel, of course. Uh, a country that loads its government and wants nothing more than to get rid of them. But all of that is going to happen from within, not from without. There's nothing that we can do in order to make democracy, uh, 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 make Iran a democratic state. Iranians will do it themselves, and they're doing a marvelous job of doing it. Every time we reach out to the Iranians, they say, leave us alone. So let's leave them alone. The only thing that we can give Iran is, is the help of, of being part, very slowly, of the international community once again. As I said, a tyrant stays in power by isolating his people. We are helping the Iranian government stay in power. We're not hindering it. And with that, I bid everyone an adieu. Uh, there was a technical mix-up at the end of this dialogue, and uh, I just want to say it was a good dialogue, and thank you very much.